Some changes have been made throughout the week in the couch investing portfolio compared also to the S&P 500 were basically flat. Now, since the start back in early February, we are still down 0.67% compared to the S&P 500, which is up 2.92%. Of course, we had quite a recovery in the last couple of weeks. Now, what has happened in the portfolio? Like I said last week, I've added some cash to the portfolio for quick trades. I know it's risky. I told you last week it might work. It might not work at all. And even if it works once, I could lose it all the next time. I don't usually do this, but I feel pretty confident going into these next couple of days of earnings. I've opened up a position in Robinhood that's already up 5.71%, only playing the earnings game here. And I've added two Palantir. I've added, you can see this exactly here at $22.50. It is now 6.19% of the portfolio. There still is some cash left. I will probably put that to work in SoFi or actually add a bit more into Palantir on Monday, going into the earnings report. Then if it works out, I sell only part of it, put it into Robinhood and then sell it all after the Robinhood earnings report. Hopefully it will be a double win and then I'll use that cash to allocate accordingly into the other positions in that portfolio. I've also completely exited from Apple and I opened a position in Meta after it came down a little bit. That position now is already up 4.49%. Now next week, this is basically the schedule with regards to the big companies reporting. So on Monday, after the market closes, you've got Palantir, Lucid, Realty Income, Hims and Hers, Horrible CEO, I hope they go under. Yes, it's a personal thing, but screw that guy. Then you've got Rocket Lab as well and Exxon. On Tuesday, before the market opens, Walt Disney actually, before the market opens, Celsius, Datadog, Crocs, Nikola, Ferrari, BP. After the market closes, you've got Rivian, Upstart, Win, Casinos, Lyft, Twilio, and Toast. On Wednesday, before the market opens, Uber, Shopify, Affirm. After the market closes, I'll probably cover Arm and Airbnb and probably Trade Desk as well. You obviously also have Robinhood. Then on Thursday, before the market opens, Roblox, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Plug. Those are the, let's say, bigger names or more popular names, should I say. After the market closes, SoundHound, CleanSpark, and Unity. Of course, do let me know down in the comment section below which earnings report you're looking forward to. We're going to try and cover as many as possible on the channel, like we've been doing for quite a while now. If you enjoy these type of videos, leave it a thumbs up, subscribe if you have not, we'd really appreciate that. And now let's talk about Palantir. Because Palantir, of course, big fan of the company, shareholder of the company for quite a while now. We've seen the highs, we've seen the lows, and now we're back to seeing the highs, but in my opinion, this is just the start. So let's have a look at what we could expect, what analysts are expecting and what actually happened throughout the quarter. We do see a difference in commercial. We didn't give last quarter's uh, results, obviously, but the quarter before we grew 70 percent and we are we are we have a nascent and terrible sales force. We still grow at 70 percent. Now, imagine what a real sales force could do <laughs> with those results. Now, of course, with that 70% year-over-year growth comment, there's a bit more context that I'll add in just a second, which probably most of you know. But if we look at this, this is from Palantir Bullets. This is from Arnie's newsletter. Link is down in the description. Great guy. No, I'm not his brother. Maybe from another mother, but not that I know of. Anyways, these are most, if not all, of the partnerships contracts that were awarded in Q1. And these are the ones in Q2 that we know of so far. So we've got the Oracle partnership, robotic combat vehicle prototype selection with Anduril, awardable designation for Tradewind Solutions Marketplace, grant with Colorado Wyoming Regional Innovation Engine, HD Hyundai for unmanned surface vehicle to replace manned ships, Parexcel multi-year partnership for clinical trial AI, and of course, of course, Titan. Then with regards to the expectations, these are numbers that I've taken from Coifin and Sinkig Alpha. Link is down in the description. You can help me out. You can help yourself out. There's, I think, a 20% coupon there. So help yourself out. So for the upcoming quarter earnings, EPS normalized estimate of $0.08, cents, a gap estimate of $0.03, cents, with revenue estimates of $617.61 million, 
EPS revisions in the last 90 days, we've got seven revisions on the upside and zero on the downside. If you look at the annual EPS estimate for December 2024, forward PE, if you take that number, that's 33 cents, forward PE 70.92. There are 17 analysts that are covering that. December 2025, we're going a bit higher, 40 cents, so 58.99 forward PE. If you look at annual revenue estimate, $2.68 billion for this year and December 2025, $3.23 billion, that's a forward price to sales ratio of 16.1 times, of course, quite expensive. Then if we look at the current average analyst price target that sits at $20.24, representing 13.24% downside from the price we're at today. If we look at some valuation metrics, forward PE currently at 70.9 times. Of course, this is next 12 months. If you look at the last 12 months, you can clearly see that earnings are growing and growing quite fast. As you can clearly see also the analyst expectations. This is again on Coifin, link is down below. EPS expectations growth for this year, 31% year over year. Fiscal year 2025, another 20% growth and then fiscal year 2026, close to another 20% as well. So that forward PE can come down quite quickly, of course, unless the stock goes up much faster. Now, sales expectations, Growth rates are expected to stay at around 20%. At least that's what the analysts are expecting. I expect quite more than that. And Palantir is probably expecting more than that as well. Now, if we look at a couple of trends here, this is from Emir Seeking Alpha. Great guy, great follow on X for all things PayPal, Palantir, now Tesla as well, a virtue. Great, great follow, does amazing work if you want to look at the value of the company and not just the price. I highly suggest you follow him, plus his Seeking Alpha is down in the description below as well. So he shows us here a chart, quarter over quarter growth and total customer for the period ending. It's pretty clear that in the last couple of quarters, we have seen some reacceleration in growth. Overall, customers have been added each and every quarter. So it's nice to see that although the overall number here becomes bigger and bigger, the quarter over quarter growth does not slow down. Now, the question here is, of course, will that trend continue? Then with regards to US commercial customers here, of course, also AIP bootcamps effect come into play. It's pretty clear what has been happening here. The same question can be asked, can this continue? In my opinion, it can. Nothing has shown me that we're going to see a slowdown. The only thing is that, yes, it's true, we're having quite a lot of bootcamps, but just because you have boot camps doesn't mean that the next quarter you're going to see those new customers already in the report. No, it's usually it's going to take a while for commercial and especially also for government. And like I said at the start of this video, like Carp talked about the 70% year over year growth. Now, it is true, right? <laughs> it's not a lie. But if you look at Q4 of 2022, they actually lost some revenue there quarter over quarter. So it's closer to 40% growth year over year, which again is quite amazing. If we can continue like that, I mean, why not? Plus, if you look at the current quarter over quarter growth, we're sitting at around 12 to 13%. Again, reading everything that we've read, we've covered a lot of things. I do expect to see some acceleration in this quarter. So probably higher than 13, would love to see it higher than 15%. Now, just because you don't see the full effects of boot camps already in the next quarter or two, you can clearly see what's going to happen in the future. If you look at total RPO, if you look at billings, billings, for example, from last quarter year over year growth was around 56% or so. So expect that to be seen in the financials in the coming quarters. Net dollar retention was at 108%. It's up from 107% in Q3. I'd like to see that number grow again and again because, well, for a year or two now, that number has come down. Now, just because we like to talk about the commercial side of things, which of course is growing quite fast, we should not forget about the more stable, more secure side of the business, shall I say, which is government. So this was from last earnings call. We'll continue to onboard partners and demonstrate the value of mission manager during this option year to deliver on the Army's multi-vendor ecosystem vision. 
On the strength of our work on the ground and our software that actually works, we expect reacceleration of our US government business in 2024. Conventional wisdom is that government acquisitions are slow and then you need to invest in the programs that the government is buying in a two to three year acquisition cycle. That's what programs like CD1, AIDP, Vantage and Titan look like. And here's Alex Karp talking a bit more about spending more on software. Palantir is a software prime, right? If you were appointed Secretary of Defense, how would you change the way, let's start with DOD, were to operate to make sure that we're prepared uh, for a future where our adversary is the peer? So I would say with permission, um, day one, 1% 1 of all spend goes to software, software-enabled weaponry, where the software has been proven on the battlefield, 1% of total budget. And every six months, it goes up by a percent till you get to 10%. Because it's like in business, you win where you're winning. And we have, it's interesting because you know, I kind of grew up, uh, first I spent a lot of time abroad and part of the reason why I kind of became even more patriotic was just that time abroad. But, um, kind of, um, but we underestimate our software advantage because we're just naturally as a culture good at it. And like almost all valuable software products in the enterprise context nowadays come from a one part of the USA of A. And so we, we just don't understand, uh, well actually no one really understands why we're so good at it, but I have lots of answers, but we shouldn't really worry about why we're so good at it. We should be heavily investing. And in the software context, software is only valuable if it's been proven to be valuable. We, it would be 1% of purchases are going to military software that where it's been proven on the battlefield, i.e. it's a product. And every six months that goes till it's 10% of our spend. And so it basically scare our adversaries fund. This was also something from the earnings call. And by the way, this was a quote also from Alex Karp. In software, it does not matter how much you spend. It matters who got the money and did it work. So what was mentioned last quarter, they talk here about the monetization efforts for various programs here, those will take time. The principal reason is that the Department of Defense is at the very beginning of a long-term allocation shift from hardware to software. For example, the Army is spending a mere 0.015% of its budget on command and control software in fiscal year 2024. But as we confront crisis and conflict in three theaters, this is changing. Growth is being driven by the incredible dynamism of the US commercial market and US government will follow. Think of Palantir, think of Andrew. And so if we look at the company's own outlook for Q1, they expect revenue to come in between 612 and 616 million dollars. As you've seen, the expectations are a bit higher than that. Adjusted income from operations of between 196 to 200 million dollars. For the full year, they expect revenue to come in between 2.65 to 2.66 billion dollars, US commercial revenue in excess of 640 million dollars, representing a growth rate of at least 40%. Like I said, at least 40%, so be sure that it's going to be quite more than that. Adjusted income from operations between 834 and 850 million dollars, and I have no clue why the eights are inverted. If you know the answer, let me know down in the comment section below. Adjusted free cash flow of 800 to a billion dollars, gap operating income in each quarter of this year and gap net income in each quarter of this year as well. And no, I don't see why they should be buying their own shares right now. Use that money wisely, especially now with still high interest rates. Up next, if we look at the stock, this is on the daily. $23.33 RSI. Yes, we've had some momentum in the last couple of days, especially since the lows is at around $20 or so. So probably if we do get a pop like last quarter after earnings, we're again going to be in overbought area. Now last time, yes, even after the earnings, we did go a bit higher, but when we went higher, RSI did not follow. And this is basically bearish, which is also why you see the stock go down since then good buying opportunity in my opinion. Now, next stage is set for Palantir. In my opinion, next stage is them showing that growth is reaccelerating 
across the business. It's very important for me to see sales growth, revenue growth reaccelerate more and more. This is a high margin business. So the more revenue that comes in, the more that will flow all the way to the bottom line. That way, yes, on a, let's say, fundamental side of things in the stock market, the stock will look a bit cheaper from a forward PE standpoint, price to free cash flow, price earnings to growth ratio, et cetera, et cetera. And so while right now, it's still only the seventh position in that portfolio. I expect that position to become bigger and bigger over time and extremely bullish on this company and that team, their mission especially, pretty important to me personally as well. And I think most of you watching also agree with Palantir's mission statement. I know some of you still have Pinterest in their portfolio, so it's my duty to still cover that a little bit. Pinterest did report earnings last week, the stock went up 20% or so, why is that? Well, Q1 non-GAAP EPS came in at 20 cents, beating the estimates by 7 cents, revenue increased 22.8% year over year, beat by close to $40 million. Global monthly active users increased 12% year over year to 518 million, GAAP net loss was $25 million for Q1, adjusted EBITDA of $113 million. As for guidance, they expect revenue to be in the range of $835 to $850 million, representing 18 to 20% growth year over year. So a pretty good quarter for Pinterest. They are showing the market that they can grow and they're going to grow in a profitable way. Still free cash flow that is flowing in the business. I don't hold the shares anymore because I wanted to put my money into companies where I have just more conviction, but I'm happy to see that Pinterest finally, finally, they're showing some major signs of improvements. So that's about it for this video, of course, very focused on Palantir, which is fine. Showed you a bit of the portfolio's performance right now. We're still a bit in the red, but I do expect to see an inflection point pretty soon. And then in the coming days, let's see if my trades work out. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. Lesson learned. Of course, do share your thoughts and expectations down in the comment section below. Check out the links as well. And we'll see each other on Monday for some Palantir earnings review. Bye-bye.